Um, as Jack said, I think that we uh, are at the beginning of what I see as a new field, what many of us see as a new field, and uh, I think the questions and conversations we have in the next few days will really help us define what it is exactly. I thought I would start by giving you my sense of what it is, and then also, uh, since I'm coming from the design side, not the GIS side, I thought I would also convey to you some of the issues that we're concerned about in the design community that we think geodesign can really help with and, um, and help define perhaps uh, research agendas for this new field. Um, as Jack said, uh, geodesign is sort of the coming together of geography, the study of the earth and uh, distribution of, of life on it, uh, ge the geospatial technologies which uh, look at spatial software and the analytics related to that, coming together with design, which as the computer scientist Herb Simon defines it, is the transformation of existing conditions into preferred ones. So one of the things that the design community is, is often interested in is not just making things look attractive, which tends to be the popular impression of what designers do, but actually make things work in the world and improve that function. And um, as I think you'll see in a moment, I want to make an argument that the design community hasn't been doing necessarily a very good job related to that, particularly when it gets to issues of sustainability and social justice. Um, geodesign, I think, uh, brings together two fields, both of whom have spatial thinking at their core, uh, spatial thinking, spatial analysis, the spatial allocation of information, resources, human activities. We share that. That is something that binds us together. To me, what's also interesting about geodesign is it has a powerful temporal side to it, which is that geography uh, is a... Um, uh, so, social science that looks at the way the world is and the way the world was. Uh, design is a field that looks at the way the world could be. So geodesign is bringing together temporally two fields, one of which looks at the world from the past up to the present, the other one looks sort of from the present out to the future. And uh, therein lies, I think, its capacity to enable us to address problems that we haven't been uh, very good at addressing up to now. Um, so, for example, as a social science, geography, geospatial thinking is analytical, uh, it's empirical, and it's inductive. Um, and, and in contrast, design is uh, a field that is prospective, looking out ahead, uh, it's imaginative, and it's uh, abductive, a word that you'll hear a little bit more about um, uh, in this conference, which is a way of thinking, actually it, it's it, an idea as old as our thinking about induction and deduction, which is about making lateral connections among seemingly disparate and disconnected things, finding new connections. In some ways, I think geodesign itself is a kind of creative bringing together of two fields which have been kept separate and are now coming together. But I think, um, since I'm not a GIS scientist, I thought that it might be most useful in my comments to talk about what are some of the problems we see from the design community that geodesign can help with. And, um, and I think uh, I would start by saying that uh, from the design community's perspective, a lot of what we have been designing in the world, our cities, our human settlements, our buildings, our landscapes, uh, have been designed without a lot of information about the consequences of our actions, the consequences uh, of what we're doing on other species, on distant populations, on future generations. Uh, so as a community, the design community is focused very much on the immediate needs of clients and communities in the present. And yet we've been having an enormous impact on the planet, uh, 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 way beyond what we have data to understand. And as geodesign can bring data to bear on those design decisions, it will profoundly change the way we live and the way we inhabit the planet. Um, and so I think that um, uh, from that, uh, I would like to make the argument that because we've been designing the world without this data-rich knowledge of consequences, um, we've created a situation in which we have made ourselves as a species rather vulnerable on the planet. Uh, which to me gives a kind of urgency to uh, geodesign. This is not something we have a lot of time to develop. If we don't develop these tools and start enacting them, we ourselves are going to be increasingly threatened. Uh, and this gets to my first point, which is an idea that Thomas Friedman and others, uh, such as a faculty member at University of Washington, David Barash, have made, 
which is to make the argument that we have uh, basically created an enormous Ponzi scheme with the planet, that um, humans have uh, developed a scheme over the last several hundred years in which we suck resources uh, and exploit labor around the planet in order to maintain ourselves. And as we know uh, from Madoff, um, Ponzi schemes cannot be sustained. They eventually run off the planet, as this uh, diagram shows, and that's exactly what's happened. We are now off the planet. Uh, it takes more than one Earth to sustain ourselves at our current population and levels of consumption, let alone the exponential growth that we are in. Now, for as uh, ob objectionable of what Madoff did, he really will, I think, be historically uh, uh, recognized for doing two things. He helped us realize that if you make the Ponzi scheme big enough, two things happen. One, um, uh, it uh, is something that uh, it becomes very difficult to see, and it also um, is something that we uh, want to deny as occurring. Uh, we have so much invested in the world as it is that we don't want to recognize that, in fact, we can't sustain it. So uh, one of the ways in which um, the design community thinks about Ponzi schemes is what an engineer would call a fracture-critical system. And to give you a sense of what that is, this is a photo of the I-35W bridge in Minneapolis, which was a fracture-critical bridge structure. And fracture critical systems are such that uh, they've taken all of the redundancy out of the system. They've become so efficient that if any one part fails, the entire structure collapse catastrophically. Um, and uh, I want to make the argument that um, that is a metaphor for the world we have designed for ourselves, that this is not an isolated experience. In fact, this is the infrastructure upon which we are now living. And um, that's why we have to take these issues seriously. Had engineers had a, a strain gauge on the gusset plate on this bridge that cracked, they would have seen a curve very much like this, which is that as stresses increase in a fracture critical system, they at the very end increase exponentially just prior to failure. And so one of the things we have to start watching for are these exponential increases of stress on systems uh, because that is where the next failures are going to occur, the next catastrophic collapses.